In this episode, you'll learn what's new in JUnit 5 and how to get started with it. First of all, open up the pomxml file from the sample project, and inside you'll see the good old JUnit 4 dependency. And below, you can see the dependencies needed for JUnit 5, and it's at least the API and the engine dependency. And then also there's additional optional dependencies, like the params project, which you'll also get to know in this episode. The first important takeaway is that the different JUnit versions run under different group IDs slash artifact IDs slash packages, which means you can easily mix both versions inside the same project. And also a quick note, if you're using old versions of IntelliJ or Eclipse, JUnit 5 support might not be 100% and you might need additional dependencies, but this you'll have to find out from the official JUnit 5 documentation. Good. Now create a test that's called JUnit 5 test. And then start right away by creating a setup method. And you can see in JUnit 5 the annotation is called before each, whereas it was called before in JUnit 4. And it's the same for teardown, so create another method. And you'll see it's called after each instead of after. Then create a test and call it blah, literally call it blah, because here you'll see one nice new feature of JUnit 5, and it's a display name annotation. And put in any string as value that you want, and later on that will show in the test runner instead of the method name. Then write assert true 5 greater than 6, and here's another addition. You can now use supplier functions or lambdas to generate error messages. Say you have an error message that takes a while to compute. Then you can put in, for example, a method reference to your error message function, which will only get evaluated once the assertion fails and not every time. Another nice addition is that you can now run several assertions in one test and make sure all of them get evaluated, even though one assertion fails. And you can do that by putting them in an assert all block. And then put in a supplier function for every assertion. So let's say assert equals 1, 2. And assert equals 2, 3. And also our assert true statement. So all assertions will get executed or evaluated, even though the first one already failed, because 1 is not equal to 2. Good enough talk, run the test. And then you can see a couple of things in the console. First, you can see that your display name got picked up. And then in the log, you see that there are actually multiple failures for your assert equal statements as expected, not just one. Now add another new feature to your tests called assumptions. Write assume true, five greater than six. Then execute the test. And you can see that you don't get a test failure, even though 5 is obviously not bigger than 6. Instead, the test is being ignored. So the takeaway is while assertions fail tests, assumptions simply ignore them. What's the use case for this? You could use assumptions to check the current environment. Say you want to make sure the environment equals CI, your continuous integration server, which means that that special test would only run on the CI environment and not count as a failure on other environments. Similarly to assumptions, you can also tag whole classes. So add a tag annotation to the class with a value of slow running. And then later on in your Maven or Gradle configuration, you could create specific goals that only run slow running tests, i.e. filter by tag but this is outside the scope of this episode. Instead, you'll learn about parameterized tests next. Create a new test method, give it a string email parameter, remove the test annotation and replace it with the parameterized test annotation. And then add another annotation called value source with string values of John add doe.com and larry at allison.com. 
And as a test, simply assert that the email is not null. Run the test. And in the console, you'll see that this one parameterized test was actually run twice. Once for the John Doe email and once for the Larry Ellison email, as expected. But even better, there's now a new feature that lets you create tests on the fly. And to see what that means, create a method called test numbers, which returns a stream of dynamic test objects, and then annotate the method with the add test factory annotation. And inside write return dynamic test dot stream. And then the first argument should be the test's inputs. So in this case, simply write arrays as list one, two, three, four, five, because we want to test these five numbers. But you could also use some database entities or whatever. Then the second parameter is a function to generate a display name for each test. So write is the number greater than zero. And then the last parameter is the actual test function. So let's do a number assert true number greater than zero. So basically you create five tests dynamically, tests if the number is greater than zero. So let's run our tests. And then in the console, you'll see that the five tests got created, they ran, and they finished successfully. Congratulations, you just learned about most new features in JUnit 5. There's even more new stuff than what's covered in this episode, but these are some of the most important core changes. As always, to find out about the other features, make sure to read the JUnit 5 documentation. Other than that, have fun writing your tests with JUnit 5.